Good morning. I'm Pastor Cheryl Taylor, and in the name of the God whose light we celebrate with joy on this Epiphany Sunday, I welcome you to worship here at First Presbyterian Church of Rockwall. Our opening sentence of scripture this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Today, we start a new worship series, Known and Called. There's no bulletin for today's online-only service. Our scripture reading in a few minutes will be from the second chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. I hope you'll pull out your Bibles at home now and turn to that section so that you can follow along when we get to the Gospel reading. We'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning, so I hope that you will have juice or wine and bread or crackers available so that we can all come together as the one body of Christ in celebrating the sacrament. Today at 2 p.m., we will be live streaming a service of witness to the resurrection, giving thanks for and in celebration of the life of our dear brother, Ken Strack. You're invited to follow along here on Facebook at 2, or we will be posting the service to YouTube later in the day. We'll be resuming in-person worship next Sunday, January 10th, so we hope to see you in person or online. We will continue streaming, and our new adult Sunday school class will also start both in person and via Zoom, and that will be on the parables of Jesus, so I hope you'll join Kevin Logue for that class. Our FPC Book Club will meet via Zoom on January 12th. That's a change. That's on Tuesday, not Wednesday. Tuesday the 12th at 6.30, where we'll be, we will be discussing Frederick Bachman's new book, Anxious People. If you haven't read it, you can read it in a couple of days. I know I did. I could not put it down. So I look forward to talking about that book with you on the 12th. And I will be starting a new pastor's class on the book of Revelation that will start by, by Zoom on January 20th at 6.30 p.m. So I hope you'll join me for that. And now, breathe deeply. Welcome the Spirit's presence. And let us worship God. In our worship series for the season of Epiphany, we will hear stories of people discovering and recognizing the identity of Jesus, along with their own call as his followers. The first story of identification is the visit of the Magi to pay homage to the child whom the star has illuminated. It's God's light that leads them to him, and when he is found, they are filled with joy and purpose. We too are called to be a joyful people who are known by God's light, shining through us. Because we are called to leave behind the burden of our sin as we approach the table of grace. I invite you to join me in prayer as we lay claim to the forgiveness and the reconciliation that God offers to us in Christ. Let us pray. Ever patient God, we are a people who live in thick darkness. We stumble around bombarded by news of pandemic and poverty, famine and genocide, injustice and oppression. The maelstrom of things and issues and people of the dark can overwhelm and paralyze us. Help us to be people of the light, 
shining your light of righteousness, peace, and joy into all the dark places of our lives and world. Unlike, unlock the mystery and glory of the babe born in Bethlehem. Turn our aimless wanderings into a journey of purpose, guided by your star. Let the light break into our lives and our world and transform us into your people, people of light. Amen. As surely as the light follows darkness, the light of God's love given to the world so long ago is given to you for healing, for hope. You are beloved of God. In God's name, receive the light, for in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father. As we turn to God's word, let us pray once more. Illuminating God, shine your light on this word read and proclaimed this day, that we may see you more clearly and live according to your ways more faithfully. We pray this in the name of the true light, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As I said earlier, our gospel reading this morning is the story of the Epiphany from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I invite you to open yourself up to God as you follow along with today's text. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who's been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at his rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people. Then Herod secretly called the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
One of the first things that you learn in preaching class is that you'll have another opportunity to preach any text. You don't have to cram everything into one sermon. Step away from the passage, breathe. And yet, I have so many questions about today's text from Matthew's telling of the gospel that it's really hard to rein myself in. And I'm betting that you have lots of questions too. Why? Because almost everything that we think we know about the epiphany comes from Christmas pageants or Christian tradition. Hardly anything comes from the text itself. For example, the translation we heard today, the New Revised Standard Version, talks about wise men. But were they wise men? The Greek used here, magoi, is the source of our word magician. So, were they wise or were they tricksters? They're clearly familiar with the stars, but were they astronomers, as we would know them, or astrologers who would just love the idea of a daily horoscope printed in the paper every day? One thing is sure, they weren't kings. Speaking of stars, what kind of star are we talking about? The convergence of Jupiter and Saturn like we saw just a few days ago? Or supernova? Because there was one visible in Palestine and as far away as China in 4 BCE. And I've read that its light could have lasted one to two years. Now China raises another interesting question. Where did these magi come from? All our text says is from the east. Now, the most likely place would be Babylon or Persia, which would be modern-day Iraq or Iran, in which case it would have taken them between three and four and a half months to make the trip at a comfortable pace of about 10 miles a day. But some scholars, I should add, have said that the Magi probably arrived as late as Jesus' second birthday, because remember, Herod ordered all baby boys age two and younger killed in an attempt to get rid of his rival. I read one calculation that given that time frame, they probably came from the very far east. That's right, China. Either way, let's face it, it's a lot farther than any of us have traveled this last year. Another question, how many magi were there? We have the carol, we three kings of Orient are, but were there three? only according to tradition, tradition, which is based on the presence of three presents. We don't know the number of magi, we don't know their ethnicity, we don't know their names. Those came more than 1,500 years later when the Venerable Bede decided to embroider around the edges of this scripture. Which brings us to the gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Expensive, rare gifts fit for a king but delivered to an unlikely recipient, a poor boy in the tiny town of Bethlehem. All of this leads to the inevitable query, if the Magi didn't arrive hot on the heels of the shepherds, what the heck is Jesus still doing in Bethlehem? Why hadn't Mary and Joseph headed back north to Nazareth? This one I can't answer, because Matthew's gospel is not congruent with the second chapter of Luke that we heard on Christmas Eve. Christmas pageants notwithstanding, they are two completely different narratives addressing different issues. Matthew isn't as concerned with the facts and the details of Jesus' death as he is about how Jesus fits into the messianic picture painted by Hebrew scripture. There's no manger, there are no shepherds, there are no angels in Matthew. But there is a detailed genealogy that ties Jesus to Abraham and to David and to Gentiles such as Ruth and Rahab. In Matthew, Jesus' family lives in Bethlehem from before his birth right up until the time the Magi show up. This is to fulfill the words of Micah that Herod's own scholars briefly summarized in today's text. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, You are one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord God. 
and they shall live secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. Now, don't you know that coming up with that particular passage must have endeared those scholars to the king? My guess is that Herod had their resignation more or less probably their heads by the end of that day. It isn't until after the Magi visit, when Herod goes on his bloodthirsty quest to retain power, that Joseph takes Mary and the baby to Egypt for safety, which is ironic in and of itself that a place of slavery and oppression could become the only safe space for the Holy Family. But that move was important because Jews could then, Jesus could then come out of Egypt just like Moses before him in the book of Exodus. After the return, the family relocates north from Judea to Nazareth in Galilee, again fulfilling prophecy that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. In Matthew's narrative, we have two bookends. Jesus travels from a town on the periphery of Jerusalem in Gal to Galilee to live out his life. And at the end of his life, he travels from Galilee back to Jerusalem to be crucified, to die, and to live again. This we know. But is there anything, anything else that we can be sure of from today's story? A story that raises so many questions. In a word, yes. We know that these magi, whoever they were, wherever they were from, they saw a star. And they weren't content to just study the star, to discuss the star, to talk about how it's the sign of the birth of a great king. They walked the walk, literally. They got up and they followed the star. They saw the light of God and they acted. When they got to Jerusalem, they went to the place you would expect to find a new king. They went to the seat of power, the palace. Once there, however, they listened to the words of scripture offered and they changed course. Without blinking an eye, they moved on from the palatial digs of King Herod to the humble dwelling of Jesus, nine miles down a dusty dirt road in Bethlehem. Once there, Jesus, uh, Matthew tells us they experienced joy in see seeing the child in honoring him with kingly gifts, in worshiping him, even though he wasn't at all what they expected when they set out on this long journey. Those magi were the first Gentiles to recognize Jesus' unlikely identity. They're the first people in Matthew's gospel period, aside from Mary and Joseph. In returning home, they became the first missionaries to spread the word about Jesus to the world, the good news of a new king who would usher in an age of peace, as we heard from Micah. They were so sure of his identity that they were willing to buck the powers that be by skirting Jerusalem on their way back east, trusting a dream to guide them. One more quick Magi fact, Magi are reported to have been very skilled at interpreting dreams. So, even with all the questions it raises, there are still things we can know from this text. Most importantly, we know that God was at work in and through the Magi, revealing God's self to the world by shining a light on Jesus, God with us. Matthew would be the first to point out that the Hebrew scriptures say that all the nations of the world will travel to Jerusalem to worship the one true God at the end of time. In the Magi, Matthew tells us that this pilgrimage has begun and we are part of it. We may have so many questions about those Magi, but this is sure. In Christ, we, like those wise men, have seen the light of God. And in seeing, we have known God's presence in the world. Like them, we're called to follow Jesus on the path of peace that began oh so long ago. A path that will culminate in Jesus' reign of peace on earth. May this long-awaited year of 2021 be your time your time to see Jesus anew, to recognize him as Christ, and in seeing and recognizing him, to act in ways, large and small,
to bring people together in our age of divisiveness. May the peace of Christ be with you, and may you be the peace of Christ in this new year. Amen. Once we've seen the light, we can let it shine, let it shine, let it shine as we've sung since we were children. I invite you to use this time to consider how your God light can shine and how you can give yourself to God and to God's work of reconciliation.
It's Jesus, the light of the world, who draws us to this feast. It's Jesus who invites all people, who invites you to come, to eat, to experience the greatest gift of God, Christ, who is the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Christ, who is the one true light shining in the darkness. Christ, who through this feast empowers us to shine for him as beacons of his peace. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right in our joy, Creator God, to give you thanks and praise. For in the beginning you created the heavens and the earth, and out of darkness and chaos you brought light and order. You have given life to every living thing and made us in your image, male and female. Even when we turned away from you, loving darkness rather than light, you never turned away from us. You sent prophets to show us the way, and in the fullness of time, you sent your son to be Emmanuel, God with us. At his birth, the night sky lit up with heavenly host and a guiding star. Shepherds and magi found their way to you. Women and children, tax collectors and lepers continued to find their way to you. The darkness of Gethsemane, the cross, and the grave could not overcome you, for you are the light of the world, shining still. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. In this feast, make us one with you and with each other. Inflame us with your spirit that we may be united in ministry in every place. Send us in your marvelous light into the world, ready to serve others and work for your peace. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, was at table with his followers. And at that meal, he blessed the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, this bread is the new covenant. Uh, This bread is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after the meal, he took the cup. Again, he gave God thanks and praise. And he gave the cup to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. My friends, every time we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, We proclaim the saving death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, until he comes again in glory. These are truly the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to join me now as we partake of the bread of life. and the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me now as we pray together in the words that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Following the benediction, I invite you to please post your prayer requests if you have any, and also give the peace of Christ on our Facebook feed. We look forward to seeing you again next week here in the sanctuary and on Facebook and YouTube. But until that time, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and then the days to come. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord who is our light. Amen.